Yes, people, what's happening? Welcome back to Chelsea Fan TV and welcome to another edition of the Chelsea Fan TV podcast. First things first, guys, make sure you smash the like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new around here, and as always, leave your thoughts in the comments, people. And Chelsea have advanced to the quarterfinals of the Carabao Cup 2-0 win over Blackburn on Wednesday night to set up a quarterfinal against Newcastle next month, which is going to be tricky, but you know it's a real possibility this cup could come to Stamford Bridge again for the first time in a long time. Uh, so, yeah, we, we've got that to look forward to. Also, we've got Spurs on Monday. Loads and loads to discuss with Chelsea, as there always is. And this week, joining me, Goonie, thanks for coming on, bro. Great to have you. Looking forward to getting stuck into it. Um, Mate, let's start with a game last night. Uh, obviously, the Cup is just about winning. It doesn't really matter. You just want to get through to the next round. Uh, but were you surprised with the strength of team that Poch went with? So I think people were maybe expecting a few changes, but that was almost a first-choice team. Before I even answer that question, it feels great to be here first and foremost. Once again, thank you very much for having me on. I'm a big fan of this channel. This is def this is my debut. Um, so it feels great to be on here, man. I feel like a little fanboy right now. Do you know what I mean? So thanks for having me on. And um, yeah, in terms of... You know, sorry, can you just repeat the question? I'll get into it. Just like in terms of yesterday, obviously, Cup, just, it's just about getting through. Uh, the, the performances yeah. don't really matter and all that. But you'd be surprised with how strong Poch went with the team. Were you expecting a few more changes? Yeah, do you know what, man? Um, I was... I was slightly disappointed by some ex by some exclusions, but then when you weigh when you weigh out things, how things have been going over the past twenty months, and that it, it, it's not really a long disappointment that lasts too long. Like for example, I wanted to see Petrovic start the yeah. game yesterday. He's he's a player that obviously we've signed from the MLS. We've yet to see him make his debut, and I just personally felt like if there's any time to take a risk, it's against the twelfth placed uh, Blackburn in the championship, do you know what I mean? But unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be. Robert Sanchez did get his start, did make a very good save, by the way, it has to be said. But um, yeah, I wanted to kind of see him start. Also, the situation with Ian Matson as well, although I kind of understand that it's more of issues that are off the pitch because it's a bit of a contractual standoff, isn't it? Matson hasn't signed his contract. He doesn't have very much long left. And I think Chelsea want to see some commitment from the player before they give him some commitment. And then there's also David Washington as well. He did get a Premier League uh, sniff in the in the week, albeit we did lo lose against uh, Brentford, but I thought it was an opportunity for him to also start the game. Maybe not the full 90, but to at least see what he's got, and we weren't able to see him, but the, uh, the prevailing thing is here is that we made it through to the quarterfinals, which we did. And I can't complain. Honestly, I can't complain. But it would be good to see some of these young players get their opportunities. Although we did see Alex Matos get get a few minutes and, and so on and so forth. So, you know what I mean? I, I, it's just those three really that worried me about the, that I wanted to see play. But we got through, man. That's what matters at the end of the day. No, 100%. I, I agree with you on Petrovic. I think a lot of people wanted to see him. I, look, I, I get why Poch done it, and I haven't got a problem with it necessarily, but it is a strange one, because we spent this money on him for, from MLS, and I, I'll be honest, I'd never heard of him before we signed him, but a lot of people that you know follow the MLS and, and, have, and have followed his progress you know, say that he is, he is a very good keeper and whatnot, but I'm, as you say, it's a surprise that you didn't see him in the fourth round of the Cup. You're thinking, well, unless Sanchez goes on a, a shocking run of form or gets injured... We're not going to see this guy play until January when the FA Cup starts, potentially. You know, if he, he, he even gets picked for that. So a little bit of a head scratcher on that one, but nothing like I'm not nothing that I'm like thinking, oh fucking hell, what's 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 the manager doing? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so like yeah. it, it would have been nice, but not a huge problem. The Martin one's interesting, isn't it? Because he played a lot in pre-season, but I think he's I think he's sort of a victim of like Potter obviously don't see him as a left back, and then in the forward line, now that we've kind of got Mudrick in form, Cole Palmer obviously doing his thing. Uh, Sterling's there, uh, you know, and Kunku to come back and whatnot. Like, there don't really seem to be much space for him in that forward line behind the striker either. Now, I like Martin. I think he's a good player. But I just think it's a situation where, unfortunately, the players that he's competing with are probably just better than him. I mean, I, I know the club ex activated an option to extend his contract by a year just to buy themselves a bit more time. But, I mean, bro, for you on Martin, like, I can only see this going one way, and that's him out the exit door. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if I mean we've we've always known as you know from he's come through the academy and that as him being a, a left back, and it's quite rightly like you said, um, he's he's not being favoured there by Pochettino, who is being favoured further up the pitch for whatever reason when he does come on. 
But the competition in front of him, it's, it's not really much of a comparison, if you ask me. Do you know what I mean? And it's not even a knock towards Ian Matson. It's more so that you're competing with natural wingers in their natural position. You know what I mean? So, it's yeah, I agree with you. It's only going to go one way. It looks like another academy player might be sold. Do you know what I mean? Because because for me, there's there's no point in keeping him if that's how you're going to use him. I saw a golden opportunity for him to get up, um, to, for him to get a start when you know Chilwell got injured and perhaps Cucurella wasn't playing as well as he should have. And even then, when we didn't see him start any games, it was a massive telling sign that you know Matson's either got to decide his future or he's got to go. So right now, on the balance of things, it looks like to me that he's going to be sold. I, I agree. If I was him, I'd probably leave as well. As much as he probably loves the club, he's been here, come through the academy, you know. Like, for his career, he's not going to get the minutes he needs to develop as a player and go and achieve what he can achieve and what he wants to achieve in his career by staying here. So, ultimately, I, I think he probably will end up moving on. It would have been a good opportunity to see him. I think we could have easily... I think we could have won that game with the likes of Martin starting. I think Medweke probably could have started as well. I know, obviously, people are a little bit out on him, but, you know, it would have been a game where we could have won if, if he played or... Or whatever, but obviously we got the job done two nil. Uh, you know, goal from Badi Ashile on his return. Obviously, Sterling getting one as well. Um, I want to talk about Badi Ashile. Obviously, first minutes in f probably like five months or so. I think it's the first time he's played since Bournemouth away, uh, back end of last season. Yeah, uh, get sixty minutes, gets a good goal. Uh, I love him. I think he's a great player. I think he's one of our best signings along with Palmer un under this ownership so far. Um, but mate, it does give us a, it gives Poch a bit of a headache selection now because we've got four centre backs in Colwell, the Sassy, Silva, and Badi Ashile now that are all fit. I mean, Badi is not fully fit just yet, but he's he's back in the mix. You've got four centre backs there that arguably would all deserve to play. It uh, yeah. with, with, uh, with Silva as well. We've seen it. Silva, the Sassy has been the main partnership so far this season. Colwell's obviously gone in the last couple of games alongside Silva. But, mate, what, what, what do you think happens going forward now? I know Badia Shields going to need a few more minutes before he's fully fit and kind of in, in, in the reckoning to, to be starting regularly. But, I mean, how do you see Poch sorting out this centre-back issue or, or selection heading? What, what do you think the best partnership is going to be moving forward? Because we have not got Europe to rotate. Um, and, you know, centre-backs aren't necessarily players that you sub on in-game unless there's an injury or you're trying to see a game out sort of True. last five, ten minutes. So how, how do you see Badia Shield being used? And how do you see Poch kind of overseeing that centre-back thing? Because there, there now is genuine decisions to make in, in that in that lineup. Well, it's 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 a nice headache for the fans to see, but it must be a nightmare for the manager. But then, you know, defence is an area where we don't really complain too much, man. We've got very good options, um, especially in the centre-back positions as well. Now, in terms of Badia Shile, I think Chelsea need to be very careful with him in terms of not rushing him back and giving him too many minutes at once. I think uh, Pochettino was right to take him off because I, I remember correctly, towards like the end of the first half, I did see him not walking as freely as he should. Hopefully it was just a bit of a, a little bit of tightness because of the, la the lack of match fitness, something that he's going to be able to warm down off the pitch. So I hope that's the case. But going forward, um, I mean, we don't be surprised if we do see Cole will start against Tottenham. Also not another bad option. You know what I'm saying? I'm not even complaining about that. But I think long term, it's going to be, uh, we're going to see more of Badi Ashili and Disasi for several reasons. Obviously, the obvious one being, that they had a natural partnership going on in Monaco before he even came to the, before they even came to the club. So they've already got that cohesion, that understanding between the two defenders. And if you actually hear about, you know, if you hear Disasi and Badia Shile, how they speak about each other's uh, partnership, it sounds good. They, they, they feel that they're both very balanced. They're both very much in sync in their positions, which is something that you want to hear, something that you want to see. And um, when it comes to Thiago Silva, I mean... I've I've sang this guy's praises ever since he's come to the club. We know what he is, but the you know the sad fact is is that nobody can cheat time. Thiago Silva's coming to that age of forty years old. We can't keep relying on him. He's even eluded it to him, um, eluded it to us himself. He said, you know, going forward, I can't. I'm, I'm probably not going to be used as much as I'm going to be used. But however, I'm going to be useful for the club. I'm willing to serve that purpose, which is brilliant to hear from, from from a player like that because even though he is about to turn 40 he could probably get consistent minutes elsewhere he's that fit he's that good you know what i mean he's that influential but i do think it's uh it's going to be bad yashili and disasi going forward because they've already established that partnership and another thing that i want to really agree with you on is 
Badia Sheila is definitely one of my favourite signings too that's come to the club. I mean, for a centre-back that's so young, because remember, this is a very mature position that we're talking about here. But for somebody who's so young, to be able to show that composure, even under the most amount of pressure and deal with it the way that he does, you don't find that every day. You don't find that composure in some, some senior centre-backs, but he seems to have it. Um, he seems to make right decisions on the ball as well. He's almost impossible to go around. He's such a, he's such an imposing figure. And also his positioning is brilliant as well. So we've definitely got a diamond in a rough here. I was excited when we signed him. I'd seen him at Monaco, albeit that they didn't really have the best finishes while he was there. But it's a team game. It's not down to individuals. And even then, you could see he was still one of the shining players playing for the club. So I thought it was very good scouting from Chelsea that we've got this player. And, you know, we're lucky to have him 100%. No, mate, I, I agree. It's going to be interesting. Like, obviously, Silva, I think, will still play in, in a lot of the big games this season. But ultimately, I think going forwards, I think, you know, as much as we love him and as great as he's been and still is, ultimately, like, this is going to be his last season. I can't see him extending for another year. Um, so you've got to look You've got to look ahead and think, do you know what? Would some of those minutes that Silva might get be better off being given to Badia Shile, being given to De Sassi, being given to Colwell to help develop them for, 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 for the years ahead. But, I mean, we're forgetting about Wesley Fofana in all this as well. I know, obviously, he's, he's injured for this. He's out for the best part of the whole season. Um, his time at Chelsea has been plagued by injury, really. But when he yeah. has played, he has looked a top defender as well. I mean, he's almost a forgotten man. I mean, obviously, he's not, he's not back yet or anything like that. But... I mean, how, how, how do you see him fitting into all this? Because we're gonna, like, you know, there's four. There'll be four centre backs once Silver goes. It'll be obviously Fafana, uh, Colwell, De Sassi, Badia, Sheila, and, and there's reports that we might want to go and sign another one. So, I mean, how, how do you see Fafana's Chelsea career sort of panning out o o over the next year or so? Because I know he's only just arrived, but it's like it's almost a, it's like the forgotten man. You sort of forget we've got him. No, it's, 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 it's true. And unfortunately, due to the, the nature of the injury that he got, it's a very serious one. And um, if I'm correct to remember that, they were predicting that he wasn't going to feature this season, much this season, or if if at all. At all yeah. So um, I, th that, that's very unfortunate because we know Wesley Fofana is a super talented centre-back. And, you know, even talking about Badi Yashile and Wesley Fofana, that's, you know, that's a potential French centre-back pairing in the future. I know, obviously, there's William Saliba, he does, he does play for them scumbags up in North London, but he's a very good, he's a very good centre back. Let's have it right. But Wesley Fofana definitely will be in and around that French squad if if he is able to remain fit. And um, you know, the thing is, is once Thiago does go, there's an opportunity for him if he is able to stay fit to be one of those centre backs that's that's able to get a sniff. So. Um, it's just really about his fitness, man, because there's no doubt about the guy's ability. I mean, he, he has qualities that a lot of other centre-backs that don't have. He's got the extras, you know, as well as, you know, the defending principles and, and, and positioning, all of that stuff on the ball. He's brilliant going forward. You know, one of the things that he's so good at, and um, it's, it's a game that we don't like to remember, but you know that FA Cup final that we lost against Leicester? He's he class. was absolutely class. And I'm talking about even outside of the defending, his ability to just drive that ball forward and to also initiate attacks as well with his passing. He's, he's just an excellent player to have. So my only thing is, and I'm sure, you know, you echo the same thoughts, is that this, able, this guy's able to get over his, uh, his fitness issues. He's able to return back with the explosiveness that he once had. And also with the, you know, with the confidence, because having an injury like that and as a defender in such a physical position, man, it can be tricky to get back to your best, but he seems to have that 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 resilience. He seems to have that will to really want to return and, and 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 get back to that level that he once was, and improve on that as well, which is the correct mentality to have. So Wesley, I can see him, as long as those injuries don't continue to play him, it's a no brainer. It's definitely got a future at Chelsea, hundred percent. No, for sure, and you know he's still so young as well. Uh, I think the club believe in him a lot, and you're not going to like discard a sort of a seventy million pound investment yeah. uh, 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 after a year or two. But he does he does have to keep on top of those fitness issues because it don't matter how good you are if you're not if you're not available, then you're, you're basically you're useless uh, in, right. in, in 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 essence, really. But I mean, it's interesting as well because Levi Colwell, you know, obviously centre back, very talented. He's been used at left back a lot this season. You know, we see Pep basically play four centre-backs across the back four, or at least three, with Carl Walker playing at right-back. Do you think that's like something that's creeping into the modern game a bit more? I mean, I know we don't see it everywhere, but you see that Poch maybe is using Colwell there. I mean, do you see Colwell 
playing equally at left back and at centre back. Uh, it's, it's a good thing to have. I mean, I don't think he's as good going forward at left back, but you know, you, you can see he's got a good range of passing in terms of you know we saw that ball over the top for, for Mudrick for the goal against Fulham. Um, do you, where, where do you see do you see Colwell playing more at left back this season than centre back? Because um, I probably do. Pers- personally, um, I would prefer to keep Colwell as a centre back. Um, he is still, I mean, he is still very young. He's still able to adapt and, and you know, learn that left back position. But I just feel Cole will for more of a central position on the pitch with, with the vision as well of the, of the full field from the, from the centre back position. I think it suits him a lot better. And one key thing that you mentioned is, is, is his passing, his ability to, to spot a pass. And as good as that pass was from that left channel, I've seen him play those kind of balls centrally. Um, you know, over uh, throughout his loans, you know, his last one at Brighton, you you saw him do it, man. He's almost like another midfielder at times with that ball at his feet. He's that good at distributing it. And I just feel like when you're on the wings, you're a little bit limited in terms of those types of passing as well. And on top of that, um, you can see that he's not really too comfortable when he gets past the halfway line. And um, that's something that drastically needs to improve. Now, I know we've seen Pep Guardiola do it, with, with several players and other, and, and other teams in the Premier League are starting to follow suit. But we also have to understand that we're in a situation where our team is is, is figuring out its feet. It's, it's phase one, if you want to call it that. The phase thing is, is, is what's going around in football at the minute. So I think we need to really solidify our identity a little bit more before we start experimenting like that. And what I mean is, is start getting players playing comfortably in their natural positions before we start chopping and changing. Because when you look at a Manchester City, you look at that system, you look at that squad full of champions, multiple winning champions as well, they, you know, um, and they've been playing under this manager who is an elite manager, the best in the world at the minute for, for, for years and years. So that's a massive difference. That's the massive difference between us and Manchester City. I just think that we need to walk before we run, before we can, you know, start making those type of decisions. And, you know, I, I think Cole will, will probably prefer playing centre-back as well. This is it's his best position. It's his natural position as well. So why why change it? Why change it? Cucurella's coming in, and I, and I never thought I'd say this. He's he's actually starting to improve. You're actually starting Bro, to see really much well Cucurella than what we're used to. So don't fix what ain't broken. That old school saying, you know what I mean? Don't fix yeah. what ain't broken. Just 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 keep it how it is. Mate, I'm going. I'm going going through like lineups and that, or predicting lineups or lineups that I want to see for games. I'm finding myself putting Cucurella in them, and like you know, yeah. I, I like look, you don't become a bad player overnight, you know. Or just on him briefly, like obviously he come from Brighton, he done very well there. Yes, we overpaid for him. We know that Pep wanted him as well, but they wouldn't go above a certain price. Yeah, fine, whatever. We overpaid. We that, that's 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 what happens sometimes. I think I think it's difficult. Like when you come into Chelsea, it's a big step up from Brighton. It was a mess what, what, what a lot of those new players walked into there. So it, it, it was quite hard. I guess it must have been quite difficult to perform to a level. Um, but look, ultimately, he didn't he didn't do well enough. He almost left in the summer. He, he didn't. And fair play to him. He's got his head down and he's, he's he got an opportunity through Gusto being sent off, through James being injured, through Chilwell being injured as well. You, like, you need a bit of luck sometimes with your teammates going out or whatever. He's taken his opportunity and... I really, I think he, he's showing the player that we spent the money on, and you know what a good player he actually is. Yes, he's not the best going forward. He's a lot. He's a more of a defensive-minded fullback, but bro, he, he he looks decent. I think it's fair that we give him credit for for this kind of mini re, like revival that that he's going through at the moment. I mean, are you surprised? Because I didn't really have him down to feature much this season at all. Um, I mean, I'm I'm surprised because of the nature of what transpired towards the end of the transfer window. You know, it looked dead set that he was going to be joining Manchester United and he was going to be out of the door. Um, but you know, he all of all of that aside, football should be a meritocracy, man. You should be rewarding form, and he is he is in a very good form. Ben Chilwell is injured, so he is our best performing left back in the squad. So I do think that he should he should hold down his position until we're shown otherwise. Even when Ben Chilwell does come back and he is fit, he still needs to earn his position in the team. Cucurella should not be taken out because, it's like I said, it's a meritocracy. And fair play to him because a lot of other players could have down tools considered everything that this guy's been through in his personal life from, from the stick that he's got from the fans as well. Just goes to show the mental fortitude that the player's got, man. And to have something like that, 
is 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 precious. You know what I mean? So we should keep it. We should definitely keep it. We should see how he gets on throughout the season. And if we're shown otherwise, I don't see why we shouldn't be starting him going forward. Absolutely. Uh, you know what I mean? So no, bro, I, I, I agree. I'm all, all, same as you, always an advocate for play, for playing players on form. You know, if you play well, you deserve to play. You know, you shouldn't just be picked because of your name. You've got to you've got to be delivering and, and, and playing well. And, he, and he's doing exactly that right now. But I mean, yeah, we kind of sort of went on a slight tangent there. But back to the cup, obviously, we're through to the quarterfinals. It's Newcastle at home. Uh, mm -hmm. People kind of mock the Carabao Cup uh, to, to a degree. It's obviously not as big. It's the probably the smallest trophy there is going. Uh, obviously, it's big for, for some clubs, not not as much for others. But we haven't won a domestic trophy since 2017. We're not in Europe this season. Um, this is an opportunity to win a piece of silverware. Uh, and I think I think it's really important on a number of levels for myself. One, it shows that this group can can win something together. It'll be their first trophy together. That's massive, and it'll be a first trophy for the for Pochettino in England as well, which is also massive. And I think it will just give everyone everyone a huge boost. We've gone strong in 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 all the rounds so far, um, and ultimately, as fans, I don't care if it's a Champions League, an, an FA Cup, a Carabao Cup, or if it's just a fucking tin pot or whatever. You, you want to win all the comps you're in. So. Like, where, where, how, how do you view the Carabao Cup? Because I look at it this season, I think this is very winnable for us. I know we've got there's some tough games coming up. Newcastle, you might get Liverpool in the semis or the final or whatever. But this is winnable. And I, I think it's really important for us. I mean, how are you viewing it this season? Um, well, I'll start with the importance of the Carabao Cup. Um, considering considering where we are, not just not just in terms of form, just in terms of the, this this new team that we had. I want to echo it back to when we won the League Cup in 04, 05. Yeah. That was really the start of our, you know, our dynasty, I like to call it, our, our long run of success, our 20 years of success at Chelsea. And when you actually listen to what the players said at the time, right, well, after they won that cup down the line, they said the League Cup was one of the most important cups that they won as a group because it was their first taste of success together. And they didn't want to lose that taste of success. And it really spurred them on to be getting more and more and more trophies. So I hope the sentiments kind of echo between the two teams if we do go on to win something. Because, you know, winning breeds confidence. That old school cliche. And I do believe it's true. And once those players do get a hold of a trophy, they may, they, they're may they going to want to win more. They're gonna And they're going to know what it's going to take as well. More so in cup competitions to be winning these type of trophies. Now, in terms of his prestige... We know it's not quite up there with the Premier League, the Champions League and even the FA Cup or whatever. But I'm willing to throw prestige out the window and just the fact that I want to see us win a trophy based on the confidence factor that will bring on both the player and also the manager. Now, in terms of the actual competition itself, when we're into the quarterfinals and we're going to be playing Newcastle, as you know, it's not going to be an, an easy draw. Absolutely not. Newcastle have been absolutely flying under Eddie Howe, under their new ownership, and they don't look like slowing down. But if we do pull it off and if we do beat them, I'm going to tip us to go all the way to the final and win it because that's one of the most difficult draws at St. James's Park. Defensively, Newcastle are brilliant. It's going to be very hard to break down their low blocks. I do think they're low block experts when they want to be. But if we do get through then I, I I I pick us to win, and I think it will be a brilliant. It will be a great, and it will be a great way to you know progress through the season. Because I know the finals played in like February, isn't it? It's quite yeah, early it's on like end, end of February, or it's like last weekend of February, or sort of first weekend exactly, of March. Exactly, so it gives, exactly. Could give us a big, could give us a big boost for the remainder of the season. Whether we're exactly. going to Champions League spaces, Europa League, what, what, whatever we're going for, like. It, and, and especially when you, when you haven't got European football either, like these, this competition probably takes on a bit more importance than 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 it might than it might have done than it might have done otherwise. But yeah, it's, it's something to look forward to. It gets the fans excited. You know, we we, we are one step closer. It's it's not. It's still we still got some difficult games. Of course, you know Newcastle's definitely definitely not a given. But you know. It's, with a European space up for grabs as well for the Carabao Cup. I don't know if it's Conference League or Europa League or whatever it might be. Like, there's no guarantees that we're going to get in the European spaces in the league necessarily with, with the yeah. form as it is right now. So the winning a cup is probably could be an easier way to get into Europe for us this year than potentially through the league. I mean, hopefully it's not, but 
it, 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 it certainly could be. So, yeah, lots to be positive about on, on that front. I mean, we can't, we can't leave the game behind without talking about Cole Palmer. Again, I looked a class above everyone else on the pitch last night. I know he obviously didn't score, but he got an assist for Sterling. And the impact he's had in his Chelsea career so far since he signed has been it's, been, it's been phenomenal. Like, he's literally hit the ground running. It looks like he's been here for years. Um, and at £42.5 million, pounds, like on the evidence so far, I know it's a small sample size still, this looks a bargain and it looks one of the best signings along with Badia Shida that we've met that we've made under this ownership. I mean, when we were linked with him, I was a little bit, I was like, I was a bit surprised. I weren't really expecting it. Um, and it's kind of funny as well. Like you think if Nkunku hadn't got injured, would 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 we have signed him? Do, do, do you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's funny how it's funny how f- football works out sometimes. There perhaps might not have been might not have been a need for him. So yeah, I mean, I guess he's sort of Almost in a way, you're like, well, if that Nkunku injury didn't happen, maybe we don't even get Cole Palmer. But I mean, bro, how impressed have you been with Palmer? And has he surprised you at how well he's done so far? Oh, Cole Palmer's been wonderful. And um, when we signed him, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm a man, I, I admit things. You know what I mean? I thought, you know, another another young player, another player that doesn't even have, you know, five, six Premier League starts to his name. Why are we doing this? How are we going to improve when we've got these players with 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 no experience? But ever since he's come in, in terms of like his attacking contribution, he has absolutely revolutionised us. For a player that's just so young, you know, one thing that we were crying out for from the midfield, from the final third was, we need somebody to help us create these chances. We don't have that. We break down our attacks in our final third. And Cole Palmer has come in and these, and, and I think he's got like an assist a game or either an assist or a goal a game if, ever since he's joined the club, which is absolutely phenomenal considering his age as well. But, you know, that just also goes to show uh, Manchester City, you know, he's, he's, he's learned he's learned there from the best and he's able to take that and, and, and bring that into a Chelsea side and to play with so much confidence. He plays, this is another player that I've got to compare in terms of mentality with Badi Yashile. For somebody that's so young, he plays way beyond his years. Yeah. He's such a composed player. His ability to make the correct decision more times out of 10 for that age is just ridiculous. And he's also showing a lot of consistency because... One thing that I expect from from youth players is the fact that um, inconsistency comes comes with youth. You know, inconsistency comes with the learning pattern, and he doesn't seem to be slowing down whatsoever. He looks like a he looks like a midfielder that's that's about 26, 27 years old that's had three or four seasons under his belt, really controlling things for Chelsea, man. So. I'm very much excited by him. He's definitely proved me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and pretend and say, yeah, he's, I knew he was going to be a baller. I knew he was going to do this. Absolutely not. But he has come in and, and, and really impressed. And I'm excited to see his future at the club. Definitely. No, 100%. I mean, obviously, like, you know, he's going to go through dips in form and it's going to be interesting to see kind of how he respond, how he responds to that as well, because all players go through runs where they're not doing so. At the moment, everything's coming off for him, but it'll be interesting to see how players react to obviously, you know, not playing their best for, for a run of games. But look, I've got no doubt that he's going to be a top player for us and it delighted delighted with the way he started. I mean, if we if we kind of throw it forward a little bit, mate, I mean, a lot of, I want to talk about Christopher Nkunku, a lot of hopes are being pinned on his return. You sort of hear reports coming out from sources within the club saying that, you know, Chelsea might, Chelsea feel this could be, this could transform their season, his return and whatnot. And I'm sort of thinking, why are we putting so much pressure on the lad? He's not kicked a ball for us in a competitive game. He's been out for three or four months of an injury and suddenly you're hearing noises coming out of the club that we're pinning our hopes on him transforming our season. Like, I'm, I'm not saying that he can't make a... I'm not saying he can't make a difference. He absolutely can. I think he'll obviously improve that forward line. He'll get goals and he'll get assists. So I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. But why are we putting so much pressure on him? I mean, just... just I mean, how much of a difference do you think Nkunku will make? He absolutely will make a difference, but... I mean, do you think he's going to make a difference initially that sort of reports are claiming that people in the club think he might? Because I think we're putting way too much pressure on him. Um, in, in terms of the pressure, yes, we are. You know, a lot of our fan base are pinning their hopes on him a little bit. And we've got to understand it's, t- it's a team game. You, it's, it's not just down to one individual. But um, I can sort of see why there's a, there's a big expectation of the player. I mean... The numbers that this guy put up in Bundesliga have been nothing short of sensational and on a consistent basis as well. He is a top, top quality player. And I honestly believe, I'm going to go back to the World Cup, I honestly believe that potentially if it was in Kunku in front of um, Emiliano Martinez at that point, he might have slotted that down to yeah. the bottom corner and it, and, and it could have been a completely different story. He is quality. 
He can finish like a, like, like a striker. He's excellent on the ball. He's just a very multifaceted attacker and he's got very good footballing intelligence. So in terms of him being a boost coming into the team, absolutely. But at the same time, the 10 players around him also need to be on the same wavelength to get the best out of this player because this is not an individual game no more. Do you know what I mean? It, well, it's never has been. It's not, it's not an individual game. So they're going to also have to contribute to it. But I definitely think he's going to be a huge boost. Um, we haven't really been the most prolific team in front of goal. You know, we've been a bit sporadic at times. But um, I think with him, I'm going to get a lot more certainty. I mean, for example, if if, if I see Nkunku one-on-one with the goalkeeper, more I'm going to feel more times out of 10 that he's going to put his goals away. And um, I also think that's going to be brilliant for Nicholas Jackson, who I felt has been suffering in terms of um, the centre-forward role. Now, I know that Christopher Nkunku is not a natural number nine or whatever, but he does have the instinct of a striker. To be scoring north of 25 goals consistently in, in whatever league that you're playing in, and the amount of assists that it, you, you have to you have to have that instinct about you. And I think that's something that um, Nkunku, can, Nkunku can, you know, sort of show Jackson. Because Jackson is very young. He still is developing, you know? Yeah, no, hundred percent. And I think like it's it's interesting in Kunku as well because like there's a number of positions that you know he can potentially operate in. Whether he's operating as the nine, whether he plays as the ten or the second strike or whatever you want to call it. And in preseason, we saw him played uh, out on the left hand side a lot as well. So there's that versatility there. There's those options there. And you know, I think you make a good point on on Nicholas Jackson as well. Like I almost feel a little bit sorry for him in terms of us putting him in this position. This is a guy that before he came to the club, had played forty six games with Villarreal. And now he's suddenly leading the line for Chelsea. Like we shouldn't, we shouldn't have put him in this position. I think he's got good attributes. I think he's pacey. He runs the channels well. He links up the links up play well. He holds up, he holds the ball up well. But the one place where you want him to be good in the penalty box is is where he's lacking massively. His movement's not there. He's not good in the air. Um, mm. But I also feel that perhaps he's suffering a little bit from. I look at Jackson. I think there's never been a more obvious link up striker. He needs someone. He needs someone to play off. Like Sterling doesn't really do it. I was at the game last night, and I've been in a lot of games this season. Sterling drifts in off the wing too much and occupies a lot of the space that Jackson would want to occupy. And then you see it, Jackson ended up drifting wide, getting the ball out wide, and then there's no one in the box. Like you need Jackson in the box. You almost don't want him to do as much of that off the ball stuff. Um, you just want him in the box and, and just to focus on that. But like, I, f I think he's done okay. Like, he needs to do better. He's struggling. You can tell his confidence is low. But I'll just go back to the fact that I know the striker market wasn't great this summer. But this guy that's played 46 games for Villarreal, he shouldn't he shouldn't be in a position where he's leading the line for Chelsea, having just joined the Premier League. And I, I feel that the club have let him down in that sense, that we've put him in a position that he's not ready to be in right now. I have to fully agree with you. I mean, I've I've said from, from early that... I don't think Jackson's a natural number nine. To me, he looks like more of a second striker or a player that can come in off the wing inside forward because, let's face it, he does like to occupy those positions. You know, he does like to find himself wide. He does like to link up play. And, uh, you know, it, in the box where we need him, he's, he's not always there and that's a problem. You know, I'm just basically echoing, echoing what you said. And, um, yeah, I just, I honestly, I feel like Jackson right now, to be... To have that on his shoulders at a club like Chelsea Football Club, it's it's too much of an expectation for him at this point of his development. I think the club have failed him in that respect. They put too much pressure on this young lad's shoulders too soon. And I think that, you know, but we're in a situation where we can't even loan the guy because we're already short on numbers in terms of number nines at the club. Broyer's not fully fit, you know, and outside of Broyer, we've got, David Washington, who has just come over from Brazil, is 18 years old. And, you know, it might repeat, the cycle might repeat again, maybe not in, the, in exactly the same manner, but the frustration might be there as well. So we're kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place with this situation, unless we go out in, the, in January and bring in an, an, a natural number nine to ease the pressure off Nicholas Jackson and perhaps show him how the role should be played. But, um, you know, he does have good attributes. He does. But I, I, at this point in time, I don't fully trust him to be leading the line for the rest of the season. No, I, I, I fully agree with you. It's going to be interesting what happens in January as well. Obviously, touching it, Jackson will be going off to the Cup African Cup of Nations with Senegal. And Kunku hopefully will be 
match fit by that point. You'd you'd imagine so. He should be back after the after this next international break. But you, you touched on Breuer briefly there, and it's an interesting one. Like I think a lot of people at the club believe in him. He signed a new one of them six year contracts, uh, like back in I think last year. Uh, but I, I'll be honest, mate. I'm a little bit unconvinced on him. I, I haven't seen enough of him. You know, we saw little glimpses of him. He scored a good goal against Wolves and he picked up that ACL injury and he was out for a while. Obviously scored against Fulham. I mean, a bit fortuitous as it comes off him, whatever. But, you know, he's got, he's a bit of a different profile to Jackson. He's a different option. And like, that's what we don't have right now with Nkunku being injured. And now obviously Bro is injured again. Like we don't have a different option up front. You know, even if Broya perhaps isn't necessarily the answer or he's not that great, it's just a different option. It's a different profile. We don't have those options. But with Broya, I'm still I'm still unconvinced on him. I look at the kid and I just think, I just don't think he's quite got it to be a top, top player to lead the line for Chelsea on, on, on a regular basis. I mean, where do you stand with him? I'm, I know he probably needs a bit more time and he's not had a fair run potentially with these injuries. But I just look at him and I just think, I just can't see a guy. I just don't don't see twenty goals a season in the Premier League in him, or fifteen, or whatever, or whatever you want to call it. I just don't see that in him. I mean, right, right now, I don't, I, I don't see it in him. I, I, I don't either. Um, he's he's come back from a horrific injury. Clearly, he's still not fully fit because we probably would have seen him feature a lot more than he has. Um, but he does. There are qualities about him that I do like, you know, and. Um, I've, I've said many a time that there's qualities about him. So people don't get him mixed up. I'm not mm. saying he's as good as this player, but there's qualities about him that remind me of Diego Costa. Yeah, yeah. That never say die attitude. That, you know, that ball where people think it's lost or, you know, the the, the defender's holding on to it pretty comfortably. Somehow he, he gets on the end of it. It's just that hunger to get at the end of the ball, to be the one to really want it more than everybody else. And as a striker, that is a key thing to have. And that's something that he's never lost. Will he get 20 goals in a season? I don't think he's there just yet. But in terms of contributing and, and, and taking his chances and finding himself in, in, in good positions, naturally because he's been a number nine throughout his whole career, I do think he will do that job better than Jackson, 100%. And perhaps he might be the better finisher. But until you know we see him come back and he's got an extensive run of games, it's a very much an unknown element right now because that's a serious injury that he had. We don't know how he's going to return from that. So we've just got to wait and see. But is he good enough going forward for me? Should we ignore the January transfer window if he's come back? Absolutely not. I still think that we need a striker that is going to be able to take them chances and perhaps, you know, tally up a double figures by the end of the season. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. Like, you look at the team now, and look, there's good players there. They're improving. They're exciting. But there's no one in our team now that you could say, or I, I can't say of confidence that anyone in this team would score 10 league goals this season. I, and that sounds mad, but I can't, I, can't, I can't confidently say that I fancy anyone in that attack to score 10 goals in the league this season. And... I think that's kind of just just where we're at right now. Players not fully developed, not necessarily the best goal scorers. Um, but look, look, January, we touched on it. But for me, there's only one option. You do everything you can to get Ivan Tony. There's like people go on about Victor Ossiman, great player and whatnot. There's, for me, I never say never in football, but I think there's literally no way he leaves Napoli in January. Maybe the summer, sure, possibly. If he doesn't sign a contract extension and whatnot, yeah, potentially he leaves in the summer. But a mid-season sale, Napoli, for one, I wouldn't entertain that. And it would, I think it would cost in excess of 120, 130, probably could, could be more. Um, I just don't know if we're in a position to be splashing out that much money. But Ivan Tony seems the obvious option. Yes, I know he's not played football for, for, for what, it would be seven or eight months. Um, but... Like he's scored 20 goals in the league last season in a Brentford side, no disrespect to them, which hasn't got the same quality of players around him as us. I think he's a perfect striker for us in terms of how he holds the ball up, the way that he finishes. He re he's the profile of centre forward that's been successful at the club, like in the mould of a Drogba, in the mould of a Costa. Um, yes, there's downsides to every transfer, of course there is, but I see very little downsides to Ivan Tony, and he ticks a lot of boxes and like he was my number one choice in the summer if he if he didn't get banned I think he'd be playing for us already but I mean what what are your thoughts on him mate I mean do you think he's the obvious guy to go for have you got some other ideas because I think if we're getting a new striker in January 
They have to be someone, not another development striker, someone that is ready to come in and score goals right now, not someone that might be good in a couple of years. With Ivan Tony, um, I'm inclined to believe that he will be joining Arsenal. I don't think he's going to pick us, unfortunately. Um, how true that is, we're just going to have to wait and see. But I've heard from several different sources. Not anything, not like I'm any kind of chance for guru or anything. <laughs> you know, it's 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 the, the information's out there for all of us to see. But I've heard that, you know, Arsenal are in the driving seat for the striker. But in terms of him, of course, he does he does fit the profile. He is he, he's a very, very good player. To get 20 goals in the Premier League, especially in the state is in, in the way it is now, that's nothing to really turn your nose up at. So that's something we could definitely be used to. Um Quite rightly, like you said, quite the complete centre forward, that complete striker. Um, link up plays brilliant as well. So the wingers outside of him, or perhaps the midfielders around him as well, may benefit from that and get some more goals in their game too. So I can definitely see the upside to, to, to an Ivan Tony, but it's just whether, you know, we're going to move aggressively. Do you know what I mean? We need to move very aggressive for this to happen and perhaps pay over the odds to convince the player to choose us over Arsenal if the rumours are to be true. Um, there are some other options out there. I mean, Oshiman for me was my first choice because I really much, I, I very much rate the player. But I do know De Laurentiis is not going to entertain a sell in January. If anything, he might entertain a deal in place for the summer, but to actually physically let him go and come to Chelsea in January, I don't see it happening. That guy is a very stiff negotiator, first and foremost. And second of all, while they're in the Champions League, while they're, you know, still still playing in Syria, why would you want to get rid of your, your top asset? It doesn't make sense. So that one there is probably going to have to wait till the summer. Another striker that I've seen, his name's been floating about, um, is that final striker, Santiago Jimenez. Now, this is where I want to be careful. Although he does look very good, and in terms of instinctively looks like an excellent number nine, I don't like to go off just one season as reference. I don't. I like to see a little bit more consistency, which is why I would perhaps put an Oshiman or an Ivan Tony ahead of this player. But from what I hear, that's somebody that we're also considering. But however it goes, we do need to address that striker situation in January. We must bring somebody in 100 percent. Yeah, no, I, I agree. We we can't go if for the remainder of the season not signing not signing a forward. So it's going to be very interesting to kind of see how, how that one pans out. But maybe for it to kind of onto Pochettino now. Obviously, he's been here what ten games in the league. The league position's not is not is not the best. It's not what we expected. It's not what we wanted. We should have more points on the board than we currently do. Uh, you can talk about injuries. You know, he's not been able to really select a first choice 11 and whatnot uh, with, with the amount of injuries we've had, but the quality we've had on the pitch and the games we've lost should be more than good enough to beat to beat those sides. Um, I think we've played some good football. There's clear progression from last season. I know that's a very low bar and perhaps we shouldn't be using that as sort of praise, but there is, there is a clear progression. There seems to be an idea, uh, an identity starting to develop. Uh, we've still got the same problems that we don't score that many goals and we can't break low block teams down. The home form's crap. Uh, but Overall, mate, we're 10 games in now in the league. Uh, obviously, we're through to the quarterfinals of the League Cup. H how would you assess how he started? Because I'll be honest, it's a difficult. it was a difficult job anyway, Chelsea, at the best of times. But when everything's changed at the club from top to bottom in the last 18 months, it's got it's got even harder. H how would you assess? Like, where, where are you out of Poch at this point in time, 10 games in in the league? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with... You know, just look at it holistically as, as as the big picture. In terms of Pochettino, he's had his arms, his hands tied for quite a few things. So the first one, obviously, being injuries. Christopher and Kunku's injuries throwing some throwing things off. Ben Chilwell's injury. Um, who was we Wesley Fofana as well? He, he, Romeo Lavia has not even made his debut. Hasn't even played. These are these are top 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 level players that we're talking about. In terms of Lavia, yes, he's still very young, but um. To those that have watched my channel all, all through last season and perhaps the season before, I very much rate this player highly. I think he's going to be an excellent defensive midfielder, 100%. So, you know, just, just bearing in mind, you know, even if you want to put Lavia aside, we have had injuries to key areas as well, where we've been forced to use, like, for example, Ben Chilwell in the left wing at times and, and things of that nature. We're forced to be using players out of position. Something that us Chelsea fans have been singing over the past 18 
possibly even more months. Please use players in their natural positions. Use them in their natural positions. So um, I feel like Pochettino had was a little handicapped by that. But um, sometimes he does do things, you know, make decisions that do hurt himself, where there's not really an excuse for him to make them. Um, like, like for example, Ian Matson is not a left back. I mean, he's not is not a left winger. Why are we not trying him out at left back? And for example, Conor Gallagher. I see him operating off the wing sometimes. I think yesterday he finished the game on on right wing or the left wing yeah, somewhere he's like playing, that. He's playing that front three. Yeah, you know, it's it's just it's just decisions like that he needs to come away from and just trust players in their natural position and actually build the team cohesion. But at the same time, with cohesion, it comes with availability. Yeah, you want your best players available so they can develop those relationships across the pitch. And if you don't have that, and they're sporadically coming in and they're sporadically coming out. It's just like it's just like anything in life, man. You need a bit of a rhythm to get something going. So I, I do feel bad for him, but it's still quite early in the season. We are talking about ten games. There's another, you know, twenty eight games that I left. There's thirty eight games in the season. So um, it's still early to say. That's a question that I would like to come back to, possibly around the February times after the Carabao Cup final has been played. Um, but so far, I think with what he's got. He might kick himself and feel like he, he perhaps should have a few more points on the board that we currently that, than we currently have. Um, but I don't think he's done terrible, honestly. I, and, and I agree with you where we're starting to see, you know, when it when it clicks, it looks good. You know, we've we, we've we've seen examples like against Arsenal. We absolutely battered them off the park, in my honest opinion. And um, I, I I don't like to push blame onto on, onto one player, but if we're being honest. Sanchez did cost us the three yeah, points in that game, if we're being honest, you know what I mean? So there are signs. There's definitely signs that these players are buying into what the manager's doing. So it's that it's all about that P word that everybody hates, man. Um, patience. <laughs> patience. Yeah. You know, we've got to be patient. We've got to wait for our best players to come back. We've got to let them play a run of games together as well. And then we might, and then I'm pretty sure we're going to see better results. We'll find ourselves climbing up the table. No, I, I I fully agree. I think a lot of a lot of fans like sort of get sort of asking for patience and whatnot. Get that confused with accepting like bad results and and, and like a lowering of standards. That, that absolutely isn't the case. Like the standards at Chelsea will always. And I've said this time and time again. The standards at Chelsea will always be the same. To win, to win, to win the best, to win all the trophies, to play good football, and to compete. You know. For, 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 for everything and whatnot, that's always the, that's always the case. That's never going to change. That's the club's DNA. Now that's that's what yeah. we do. But there's nothing wrong with accepting that right now, where we're at, given we've gone through a massive transition, the whole squad's virtually changed. That we are not ready as a team right now to hit the standards that we have set, and we are trying to get back to those standards. It doesn't mean that we're accepting defeats to Nottingham Forest, Aston Villa, Brentford, etc. At home, it doesn't mean we're happy to bypass this season we don't care what happens because we'll be given a couple of seasons it, it, it doesn't mean that it just means that right now the, we're not ready to hit the standards and that's got to be the aim and the task of the manager is to get back to Chelsea hitting those standards so for people that think the standards have learned at this club they absolutely haven't we're just not in a position as a team to hit the standards that we've set o o over the last 20 years but I think I think he's done a good a good job. I like like you touched on. I I agree. There's certain things that I don't think he's helped himself with. I think at times in game management in certain games has, has been poor. I think team selection in certain games hasn't been optimal. But generally speaking, I look at it and you look at the amount of big chances we've missed as well, and you think as a manager, you sort of feel a little bit sorry for him. Like the the players that are, the amount of big chances we've missed you think if Raheem Sterling's free kick against Bournemouth goes in it's like millimeters from being completely over the line we probably win that game that's another two points Enzo Fernandez scores a penalty against West Ham maybe we win maybe we go on to win that game uh another that'll be another three points potentially like you look at these games where we've missed big big chances and football's fine margins and it's, and we're, we've been on the wrong end of the fine margins but I don't think as a team we're as far away from getting ourselves up the table and sort of competing for the top four, top five again, uh, that 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 than it might seem. I mean, would you agree with that? Because I just I just think, mate, that we're probably a centre forward away, that someone that puts a ball in the back of the net from going right up that table. I think there's been a lot of bad luck involved so far this season. I don't want to blame it on bad luck, but maybe outside of Forest at home, 
maybe Villa at home as well, even though we had chances in those games. Like, I don't really look at, um, I haven't been, I haven't come away from a game this season and thought, fuck, we were absolutely horrific for the whole 90 and got completely played off the park. I don't think we've been played off the park once this season. I don't, dis- I don't disagree with you. And um, in terms of, this, this is the thing, in, in the stage that we are at, we're going to we're gonna see some more of that. We're going to have a lot. We're going to have some highs and we're going to have some lows. This is just it. And this is part of working with youth. Our core of this team is our, our youth players. I mean, in terms of players that are north of 25 years old, Thiago Silva, Raheem Sterling. Chilwell. Um, ben Chilwell. That, that, that's that's it. Player. That's it. You know what I mean? So we're going to, and it's like, and it's like you said, and I have to emphasize this. Just because I'm saying this now doesn't mean my expectations have been lowered. I'm a realist and I'm looking at it through, at the situation through real eyes because you can only work with what you've got. And you've got to look at the situation for what it is. This team is not built to win everything now. Something that we've been used and accustomed to over the past 20 years as Chelsea fans. This is completely different. This is a model that is looking to sustain itself throughout the academy and the first team. So if a first team player does decide to go to a Real Madrid and he's sold for mega money, our model is the fact that we're not trying to go to all these other clubs and have these negotiations and pay over the odds. We can just go back into Coburn and say, right, you, you're a star. You come into the team, you develop, you do the job in, in, in the squad. That's the bigger picture. That's the long term vision. But um. I forgot the question because I went off on a on a tangent. What was the uh, question? <laughs> oh, just about like you know we've been a bit a little bit unlucky. You know we haven't necessarily been outplayed like off the oh, yeah. park in games yeah. this season and whatnot. Like it's been fine margins. I know that doesn't really account for much when you're on the wrong end of them, but like like we're not we're not as far away from getting ourselves up the table as as people might think we are. I, yeah, now, okay, now I remember my trail of thought. Sorry, I just went <laughs> off on a tangent. And I forgot where I was going there, but um, I think. Indeed, like, we, like we've mentioned throughout the stream, the striker is a very key area that we need to address. Um, but I also feel that we need to look at that goalkeeper position because I don't 100% trust Robert Sanchez. And when we signed him, I was very sceptical about it. And um, I, we, we've all seen why, you know what I mean? We, the, the Arsenal game being one of them. The it's one game before. where you don't want to... Yeah, the one game where you don't want to have a poor performance, unfortunately for him, he had it. And um, I, I, I'm of the belief that Sanchez really should be more of a backup goalkeeper than he should be the starting goalkeeper uh, at Chelsea Football Club. So I do feel that position does need to be addressed because if there's one position on the pitch that you never negotiate in terms of quality, is definitely yeah. your goalkeeper. I mean, look at our successful patches of history. Peter Cech, how many goalkeepers could you name that were better than him at the time? None. Not exactly. One. And we bought him while he was relatively young for a goalkeeper. Um, as well, Thibaut Courtois. How many goalkeepers at that time, although he'd done what he'd done, but if we're having honest conversations here, how many goalkeepers at that time were better than him? Right, Maybe none, none were better than him. None. The, the, exactly. That's a non-negotiable position for me. And I'd like to see us go for a, for a goalkeeper who is of that mould, 100%. Now, whether that means breaking our policy in terms of not signing players north of 25 years old, I think that needs to be an exception. We do need to look at that. We need we need more of a Mr. Safe hands in between the sticks. But outside of those two, I think we might fare pretty well, to be honest with you. I think we might fare well. What I would like to see, though, is the goal spread amongst the, the front three. So not just put all the pressure on a striker. Even if it is a Tony or a Noshman that is to come in, I'd like to see it similar to quite what Liverpool used to have, where the goals were spread. Salah would get a goal, Mane would get the goal, Fabi- uh, F- 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 uh, Firmino would get the goal. So goal scorers on all uh, on all aspects of the final third would also be a great thing to have. But that might come with that cohesion, you know. You you never know. That no. striker might be able to link them up pretty well, and we'll start to see goals being spread around. So. Yeah, that's where I feel needs to be addressed. Goalkeeper and striker, one hundred percent. No, I, 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 I would, I would agree with you on that one, bro. Last five minutes, just want to quickly look ahead to Spurs on Monday. Obviously, massive game. Unfortunately for us, Spurs have started the season pretty well. They're top. Haven't lost a game in the league so far. Uh, Madison Son playing very well. Romero and Van der Ven looking decent partnership at the back and whatnot. But strangely enough, I feel more confident going into this game than I do going into like the game against Brentford and whatnot, just because Spurs, we know are going to come out and play football. And, you know, 
we know that we we play better against teams that do do that. Now, I'd be shocked if we didn't revert back to that false nine system that we used against Arsenal, using the box midfield, cutting off everything to Odegaard, doing the same with Madison. And I think we can have some success doing that. I mean, do you fully expect Poch to revert back to that setup? Because it, it was too good against Arsenal not to use that again. I would be I would be surprised if he was if he was to divert from that tactic because it worked perfectly for uh, against Arsenal, like you said. And um, you know, this is more of a boxing and UFC type of saying, but styles make fights. And the fact that Tottenham are more a, a team that do play in the front foot can massively work to our advantage, one hundred percent. Especially if we're starting players like Mudrick and Sterling on those wings who are absolutely lightning quick and are able to get in behind those lines and get those opportunities to take shots on goal. Uh, definitely, I think we should do that. Cole Palmer, I thought, played that false nine role excellent, brilliantly. And I'm dying to see that against uh, against Tottenham. And um, it's, it's like you said, one of their star men on the team, James Madison, he's got to be kept quiet, 100%. He's got to be kept quiet. So... I'm looking at Caicedo, I'm looking at that midfield, you know, to really make sure that we shut up shop because we already know, although Harry Kane has gone from, from Tottenham, they still got another dangerous goal scorer in that lineup. And we've got to be careful with Son. But if we can cut off the supply to him, I think we might be able to surprise the rest of the Prem and show them that we can actually get a victory against these gunbags, 100%. No, I, I, look, I, I don't want to get carried away, but I, I do think I feel more confident that we can win this game than 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 beating the likes of Brentford or or, or, or whatnot. But I mean, there's going to be a few decisions to make. Hopefully, Mudrick's fit. If he is, he definitely starts on the left. Sterling on the right. Cole Palmer in that false nine. The, the midfield, we know what it's going to be. Gallagher, Enzo, Caicedo. But at, at the back, um, I think it's clear Thiago Silva will obviously come back in. Uh, James will play at right back. Um, left back, I guess, stick with Cucurella. Who would you play partner in uh, Silva? Do you go Colwell or De Sassi? Because I think Badia Ashile is, is not ready still to come in and start this game. So who, who would you go with at, to, to partner Silva? Because it probably it's going to have to be Silva or it's going to have to be sorry De Sassi or Colwell a lot alongside him. You'd imagine. I can't see Silva not playing this game. Um, I'm again. I'm going to stick with my principle of meritocracy, and I personally don't think De Sassi is really putting a foot wrong since he's mm. come in as a centre back for Chelsea anyway. The right back with against Brentford, I, I don't yeah, really think it was, it was just a, it was just a bad choice by the manager. But in terms of being an actual centre back, I don't think he's he's put a foot in wrong. So for me, it would definitely be Thiago Silva and Disasi. Yeah, no, for, for sure, for sure. I mean, just lastly, mate, how, how do you see it going? Do you like do you do you see it being like a cagey game? Do you see it being a lot of goals in the game? I mean, how how do you think it's it's going to go? Because I think we'll create chances, and I think we will like have opportunities to score. It's just, can we keep them quiet at the other end as well? I mean, just just barring San a Sanchez Howler, I think we'd be able to cope because I thought defensively we were pretty good against Arsenal yeah. until... And, and another thing as well, I, I can't really entirely blame Sanchez. I think Pochettino needs to be very careful with these substitutions. Because I do feel like two nil up against Arsenal, some of the substitutions were a bit knee jerk and they were a bit too early. So he's also got to time his substitutions properly and he's got to make this right personnel switch. But in terms of our preferred starting back four against Tottenham, I definitely think that we've got enough to contain them. But I can see them enjoying the majority of the possession. But we'll be OK with that because we'll be able to defend that. And it's like I said, I'm going to revert back to the counter attacking technique, uh, the tactics. I think that would work very much in our favour. As good as Van de Ven has been this season, to me, he's, he's, he's been a very good centre-back. Right, yeah. but, but I do think that chances will come. I think that we will get our chances. And again, it's just really about taking them and being prolific, man. Man, that's always the question with us. Can, can, can we take our chances? Like, it's, like, we've got to a point now where we know we're going to create chances. We're just banking on, well, what, what finishes are going to turn up? Are we gonna, is it going to be the attack against Burnley? Have we got four? Or is it going to be the attack that couldn't score against Brentford? Like, you just got to hope that the boys have got their shooting boots on. But yeah, it seems like a good place to round this one out. Gooney, thank you so much for your time, bro. Greatly appreciate it. I mean, the people want to check out more of your stuff and what you do and that. Where, where should they go? Um, well, thank you very much for having me, first and foremost. I'm a big fan of, of, of this platform, like I mentioned at the beginning of the stream. So I feel very chuffed to have my debut on here. It feels like a long time coming, but I'm here now. But um, in terms of where you can find me on a more regular basis, 
Man Knows Football is the channel. It's the same on the socials. So go over there if you do like my trail of thought when it comes to Chelsea Football Club. So, yeah, man, Man Knows Football is where you can find me. Guys, make sure you go over there and check it out. It'll be tagged in the title. Just click it. Subscribe. Show Goonie some love. Loads of great stuff on there. So make sure you do that, people. Uh, from myself, guys, uh, we'll catch you again in another episode soon. Make sure you smash the likes on the video. Subscribe to Chelsea Fan TV if you're new around here. And leave your thoughts in the comments below, as always. Southgate out. <laughs>